If your question was ever how far does it go, the answer is yes. This is the AQ-177 from Anioki. Oh, these names are weird. Anyways, it's a battery with a bike attached to it. Costing me only a sunburn, possible heat stroke, and a potential loss of sanity. There's two deer, and we're straight up having a staring contest. I was able to take it on an 80 mile trail ride where we pushed it probably a little harder than we should have. Personally, I find it only natural that when your battery was designed by Tony Stark, the subtle details about a quote-unquote bike may not be as important. Of course, as always, I have every intent on being thorough with my investigation of this particular bicycle, but it's hard to focus on any of the nitpicks when every time I get on it, my brain defaults to <laughs> bike go far. That being said, there's still some important things you should know about the AQ-177 from Anioki. This particular bike has a healthy mix of both positive and negative features, so I'll just mix them together. The particular model I've been testing for the past four weeks has the 48 volt power system with a 60 amp hour battery. For a bit of context, a 20 amp hour battery is on the upper size of what I look for in an electric bike. And this is three times larger than that. They claim this bike has a range of 100 miles with throttle only operation and 200 with pedal assist. Now, I cannot vouch for their pedal assist range because there's no universe where I ride this bike for 200 miles on a single charge. However, I will vouch for their throttle only range, unlike a lot of companies that give you the max range based off of ideal conditions with a lightweight rider, it doesn't appear that they've done that on this bike. I noticed that at 20 miles an hour on flat ground, I pulled 10 amps. It's a 60 amp hour battery, so that's 6 hours, 20 miles an hour for 120 miles, but you have to minus a little bit because as voltage goes down, the amperage will go up slightly, so 100 miles just seems to be spot on. When I got home after 80, I still had a significant amount of battery left. The peak efficiency of this bike appears to be right at 20 miles an hour as well. Above that, I noticed amperage goes up significantly. If you want to pull full throttle for 28 miles an hour, wherever you go, you're still looking at about 60 miles of range, which is significant. Topping the list of deep philosophical questions which may never be answered, such as will we solve cold fusion? Is there life on other planets? Why doesn't my 60 amp hour battery bike have a USB charge port? I don't have the answer. All I can tell you is if you enjoy the comforts of utility, you won't find it on this bike. Why they decided not to put a charge port on here is mind boggling. Looks are subjective, but personally this gives the feel of a moped. You know who else might think that? The police. So if you live in an area with draconian bike laws and robotic officers who haven't had their source code updated since the 1980s, be prepared to deal with some legal drama. At 6 foot 4 I found this bike to be quite comfortable and its generous step through design will accommodate short riders. The bike offers up to 9 customizable pedal assist levels, which is great for the short riders who can take advantage of that, but due to limits in seat post height and handlebar adjustments, tall riders really won't do much pedaling on this bike, even though it's still comfortable. If your height does complement pedaling this bike, you'll be happy to know that it has a rather short gear ratio, meaning that it's easy to assist the bike on steep hills, but cadence in the higher speeds it really isn't there. Up to about 16 miles an hour is all you're going to get before you're ghost pedaling. An important thing to note right away if you are considering this bike is its weight. The steel frame combined with the massive battery and larger than average motor means this thing is heavy. It's, it's like really heavy. Thankfully, due to the torque provided by the smaller 20 inch tires and the larger than average 1200 peak watt motor with a 750 watt cruising speed, it has plenty of torque to get this heavy bike up to cruising speed quickly, and you're going to need it if you decide to maneuver this around any obstacles. And just keep that in mind if you plan on taking it trail riding. Either carry a chainsaw or be prepared to go around obstacles because you're not lifting this over anything. And that extra weight is important to consider when thinking about storage and logistics. If you have a flight of stairs, forget it. This is not the bike for you. If you're thinking about packing it in the back of a vehicle to take out to a trail, not going to happen. This is the vehicle you take to the trail. 
I was excited to see when reviewing this bike from other content creators that it was available with a full twist throttle, and then gravely disappointed when it showed up with the half twist throttle that I loathe. In their defense, they said they had to change it due to some quality issues, and I'll admit the quality of the half twist throttle is pretty good, it's just, it sucks in comfort. Luckily, the bike does come with cruise control, so it's not a big deal. However, on my particular model, cruise control is not activated by default. You have to hold down the plus button for a few seconds, then it'll turn on. But it won't, like, really turn on. It'll just become available. You still have to hold the throttle for, like, eight seconds before it'll actually do anything. Which is fine when you're cruising on smooth streets, but damn near impossible to activate the cruise control on a bumpy trail. A message to electric bike manufacturers, please just give us a cruise control button. At the time of recording, the AQ177 comes in at $1,650 when you clip the coupon code on the website. That's about average for e-bikes that I've tested on the channel. A little on the upper end, but not by much. When you consider this bike essentially has three batteries in one, and that they didn't skimp on the important details, I have to say that's pretty impressive. Among those important details, the braking system on this bike is more than adequate for its weight class. I've been seeing this Dyslin brand pop up from time to time and have always had good experience with braking performance on any bike that uses it. Although that's likely not a name brand that anyone recognizes here in the States, I like them because they use the quad piston hydraulic calipers, thick 180mm rotors, which look like they belong on an actual moped, and the thumbscrew adjustable brake levers. This is a full suspension bike, but there's some details I'd like to point out. On any other bike, I would say that the front forks are actually on the upper end of quality for suspension. However, due to the weight of this bike, I feel like they're working overtime and have bottomed out a handful of time when unexpected obstacles arrive. So although I can't complain about their quality, I feel like in the long run they're just not going to be up to the task of this heavy bike. For the rear suspension, don't be fooled by its looks. Although I can't complain when something looks nice on a bike, the reservoirs are just for show. They're hollow plastic as far as I can tell. They might be air shocks in the rear with coilover suspension, but there's nothing on them I see that's adjustable. I can't complain about their quality, they did just fine on my trail ride, but they're nothing special. The rear cushion and rack look like they can hold a lightweight rider, but this is not heavy duty, so I wouldn't put a full-grown adult on the back. If you do plan on carrying a passenger, do it at your own risk. And this does not include foot pegs. Previously, when I reviewed the Ingwe X26, I was confused about bikes that didn't include foot pegs, but had a cushion on the rear rack. And I think this is due to legal constraints. If they place foot pegs, then the bike would be designed to accommodate a passenger. And there might be some legal trouble they would get into. I really don't know. If carrying dynamic cargo does not appeal to you, rest assured there's plenty of real estate on the rear rack. The rear cushion can easily be removed, but I didn't find that to be necessary. However, you're probably going to want to go with panniers. On the plus side, this can fit the large oversized panniers that I'm using here, but if you want to use a basket, then things get a little funky. As there's no solid tie-down points on this, I was able to make it work, but it just never felt very secure, so panniers is probably going to be the way to go. The knobby 4-inch wide fat tires did better than expected on the trail during slippery situations. Of course, they had their limits, but they deal with the weight of the bike better than expected. That rubber is mated to 20-inch spoked wheels. I would have rather seen alloyed wheels just to have one less thing to worry about in the long run, but currently I have no issues with the spokes on this bike, and they are using sealed bearings, as many of you know, always appreciated. The full coverage plastic fenders did a pretty good job at keeping me clean in the muddy situations. The plastic is what I prefer because it doesn't make as much noise and it's less likely to break unexpectedly, causing a severe accident. There was one negative, which really won't affect 99% of riders, but I ran into some red mud and I found that the clearance between the fenders and the tires is not really much, which well, that was fun. 
The bike's integrated lighting system powered off the internal battery has some hit and misses. On the plus side, the headlight is tied for first place being the best I've ever seen on an electric bike tied with the Fido T1. Might be the same headlight, I can't remember. It's very bright, has long throw for distance, and a wide spread so you can see what's off to the side. It's also mounted to the fork so it rotates with the handlebars, making visibility even better. One note and small nitpick about the headlight, under rough road conditions, it does tend to bobble around a bit. Not enough to really impact stability, just to kind of be annoying. It's mounted to a large, soft metal bracket. I have no concerns about this bracket breaking, but it has to be soft because that's the only way you can adjust the headlight's position. You need to bend it down a little bit so you're not blinding oncoming traffic. So I'd say it's functional and safe, but has room for improvement. As for the tail light, I think something was lost in translation about how a tail light's supposed to work. I'm not sure how well it shows up on camera. The tail light is pretty bright, but it's very pale. It's a pale red, it's almost white. In person, it looks like a white light at a distance. So motorists seeing this wouldn't immediately realize that it's a bike in front of them. This needs to be bright red, not pale red. Now, the bike has turn signals, and as many of you know, turn signals on these bikes are they're pretty much useless the way they come from the factory, but I'll never complain about them being there because, with the wiring already in place, you can upgrade to better, brighter turn signals down the road and spread them further apart on the rack. So, it's always nice to see. Included with the bike is three NFC key cards, and these are actually really nice. Yeah, personal preference, but I like them. They're very close field communication, though. I was able to get one to work inside my wallet, but just barely. I found it convenient to just tie one to my helmet, and then, you know, whenever I get off the bike, it's always with me, and nobody can just hop on this thing and take off. And because it's so heavy, they couldn't even throw it into the back of a truck without multiple people to help them. It's literally like trying to steal a motorcycle. So not impossible, but just not easy. If you're somebody who loses keys all the time, you can set this up with a password, but I don't know if there's a way to disable the password and the NFC, mainly because I just didn't bother to check. I found that my phone has NFC capabilities and did try to copy the key so that I could get it to work with my phone, but was not able to do so. This might be possible, it might not be, I just don't know. I've never used one of these before. They opted to go with a larger than average seat, and this was greatly appreciated. It's certainly no Cloud 9, but given the range you're expected to push this thing, you're gonna need it. And I would suggest upgrading even further if you're really adventurous. And on that point for a moment, I would like to talk about range dynamics. I'm sure there's going to be somebody in the comments saying, Oh, you haven't gone long range unless you've gone across the country. Yeah, okay, well, for the 98% of people who are watching this video might not realize just how ridiculously far 100 miles is on a bike. And although this bike handled the 80 mile trip went above and beyond what I was asking it to do, mainly because trail conditions were worse than expected, I didn't handle it nearly as well as the bike. This is nothing against the bike itself, it's just that the last 30 miles were an absolute gruel. And I was questioning on whether or not I was going to make it. And Probably the biggest reason why I pushed forward to finish this trip was because I dreaded the thought of calling my ride and trying to lift this into the back of a truck, so I kind of had no choice but just to take the bike all the way. Yes, I know, taking the battery out will make it much easier to lift, but I was so drained on energy that I was regretting decisions at this point. Having said that, if you ask for my opinion on who this bike would be practical for, Courier service comes to mind. Something like Uber Eats and DoorDash could certainly get some benefit out of the massive range on this bike, as you can hammer the throttle for hours and deliveries without worrying about recharging or running out of power before your shift is over. 
and really just anybody who wants to charge the bike once every one or two weeks and just not worry about whether or not it's going to have power when they get on it. Lastly, I'd like to touch back on how this bike appeals to law enforcement. Even though this bike complies with Class 3 e-bike regulations, most towns have that one officer with literally nothing better to do than to harass people for technicalities. And they'll start salivating when they see this thing, so just keep that in mind. To sum up my first impressions of the AQ177 from Anioki, the bike does exactly what it's intended to do go really freaking far and they didn't skimp on any of the important details that I look for in a bike excluding the USB charge port and for some reason having a pale red tail light other than that I don't have many complaints the frame of the bike is not very refined but it is sturdy and I don't see any issues with it carrying the weight maybe the front forks after extended use will need an upgrade other than that, I feel like the rest of the build will hold itself together. Myself, personally, I like to stay low-key under the radar and not draw any attention to myself. And although it's an electric bike that doesn't really make any noise, it is difficult to do with the styling. If I do decide to keep this bike, I'll probably consider upgrading the rear shocks as well as the front fork. I don't have an issue with the rear shocks, but I would like to get some nice oil-filled shocks for better dampening. So I hope you guys got some useful information out of today's video, or at the very least, were mildly entertained. And until next time, ride safe. Little piglet. Oh, look at the little piglet. <laughs>